Hello, I'm glad to welcome the participants of the mass media at the expert discussion how the new Arctic strategy works, legislation, preferences, uh, jobs and uh, development impulses. Our discussion is within the framework of the third Northern Sustainable Development Forum. Some of our participants are online, some of them are offline. Now I would like to introduce those who are online. Mr. Haritonov, Chair of uh, State Duma Committee on the Problems of uh, Far East, Maria Pirova, the Development Corporation of the Far East and the Arctic. We still hope that the Director General of this corporation, Mr. Nosov, will join us, but he is now on a business trip in Blagoveshensk, and the connection is unstable, but we are still hopeful. So he might join us. Also, we have Vitaly Kluyev, Director for Department of State Policies in uh, sea and uh, domestic water transportation of uh, Russian Ministry of Transportation, and Mr. Romanenko from the Center of Arctic Initiatives. And today in the studio in Saha Media, I have uh, Mr. Vasiliev, Executive Director of the Northern Forum, and uh, Alexander Kugayevsky, Vice Rector for Analytics and Expert Activity of Amos of Northeastern Federal University. A great expert of all strategic uh, directions of the Arctic development. So we are starting. In the year 2020, they signed a pack of federal laws aimed to develop the Arctic zone. And since last August, uh, the entire Arctic has become a free economic zone. According to the experts, all the benefits that are given are better and uh, they prevail over all the uh, conditions that are provided in Europe and Asia. So they believe that this system will result in a higher economic activity and uh, more equal opportunities for economic activity. So how these strategic goals will be implemented practically and how the new Arctic strategy works and what are the priorities, we will discuss during the hour. And now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Haritonov. So, Mr. Haritonov, in your opinion, what is new in Russian legislation? What new state support measures are already in place? What we need and what should be improved? Good morning, dear friends and dear colleagues. On behalf of the Committee of the State Duma on the Regional Policies, in the sunny Yakutia from a foggy Moscow, and I think that our work will be very creative. Today we face strategic challenges on the development of the Arctic zone of the Russian Federation, and together we can consistently tackle them. Lana said that uh, uh, in the previous two years we have done a lot to improve the legislation in the Arctic areas, we adopted the strategy of uh, development of the Arctic zone of Russia. And we discussed this law. There was a lot of uh, discussion and there were a lot of disputes. The State Duma and our committee were actively involved in the work on improving the Arctic zone of Russia. And this year we approved a new reading of the state program of the Arctic development until 2024. And uh, almost 15 billion rubles have been allocated. 3.5 billion rubles have been allocated for 2021, which is quite a lot. So in total, uh, there were no budget allocations before that. It was just analytical. 
And in the year 2018, they allocated 800 million rubles. And we always discussed the issue of lack of funds and always uh, suggested to uh, increase the amount of funds. And now the Ministry for the Development of the Arctic and the Far East proposed to prolong this program until 2030, and we supported it because it will allow to create tens of thousands of new jobs and uh, improve the income. And, uh, it will allow to attract investors and qualified staff. The important part of the state program is to create conditions for the social economic development of the Arctic, and uh, it implies for some uh, measures to support the indigenous peoples. But there are no funds for it, and the committee believes that uh, when this federal law is uh, reviewed in uh, uh, the State Duma, we have to uh, assign some funds. And I think that uh, on October 12th, at the first meeting of the new Duma, we will raise these issues. The amendments to the law on entrepreneurship in the Arctic uh, have been affected and uh, they give some preferences for those who do business in the Arctic. And uh, uh, since August, now we have launched a program of the Arctic Hectare, which can also attract uh, new residents to the Arctic. Far Eastern is for different, uh, Far Eastern hectare is different from the Arctic hectare, but uh, both of them can be legally executed and uh, uh, it gives the opportunity to use this Arctic hectare within the urban territory to attract more tourists and also to do some business and to construct uh, private housing. And it will stimulate the people to live and work there. At the same time, people are no, not so eager to go to work in the north and the outflow of population makes some 12,000 people a year, and our president keeps talking about it. And at the Far Eastern Economic Forum, he mentioned it also, although he said that the outflow decreased. Uh, another issue is to uh, bring back the youth to the region. It is obvious that the youth would like to live and work in uh, convenient and comfortable conditions. So we have to provide them with uh, good uh, salaries and uh, housing and uh, social infrastructure, just as good as in St. Petersburg and in Moscow. And thanks to all these measures, we were able to stop the uh, outflow of population and to uh, attract uh, people to live in these harsh conditions. Everybody knows that there is a high personal demand in the Arctic and uh, the prospect of losing uh, high quality personnel in these strategic lands is uh, not very uh, pleasant for us. And so the uh, Arctic strategy approved by Mr. Putin um, identifies specific tasks, and the first task is to improve the living conditions. We have done a lot, but we still have to do a lot. And in the opinion of the committee, without an integrated law that would uh, work on the improvement of living conditions and including the in indigenous peoples, we would never reach the, uh, achieve the result. The major uh, priority of uh, Russian chairmanship in the Arctic Council has to be a joint international work 
aimed at balanced development of the entire Arctic region. Today, we aim to create good conditions for living and working, and the State Duma of the Eighth Convocation will continue doing that, because only with our combined efforts we will be able to do it. We see how our so-called friends also want to penetrate into Arctic, and this is not a secret. It was for the first time that we received a Norwegian ambassador at our committee, and we perfectly understand that the countries that are located uh, along the sea route would like to be engaged, but I think that this is a, a specific conversation, so I wish our session uh, fruitful work and uh, good solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nikolai, uh, in your presentation you have stated the major trends that we are going to discuss. So one of the hottest issues is the issue of infrastructure and the ways that will join the entire Arctic zone. Now here at our session, at this expert discussion, we have Vitaly Kluyev, and I wanted to ask him about the transportation, the sea transport, and the internal water transport. So what are the prospects development, and how is it prepared? Good afternoon, good time of day, dear experts and colleagues. And first of all, thank you for your invitation to take part in the sessions. I am the director of the Department for State Policy in the field of sea and internal water transport of the Ministry of Transport of Russia. And I would like to talk a little bit about what we are doing. Arctic in recent years takes a special place not only in the in politics and life of the Russian Federation, but also in the world as a whole. We know this from the activities of the Arctic Council, where all of the countries who are not really in the Arctic are trying to join at the moment, for example, Korea, Japan, and so on, who all have interests in the Arctic. And their interests, first of all, are in sea shipping. The Northern Sea Route is and sea route uh, which is located north of Russia and it is uh, actually uh, legally set and according to the UN Sea Charter there are specific rules for navigating in these icy waters. Uh, about in uh, 2018, uh, a number of resources have been dedicated to this uh, sea route uh, from the point of view of cargo shipping and uh, Ministry of Transport is still functioning as the regulator of the sea route, but the economic activities on behalf of the state has been given to the state corporation Rosatom, including the implementation of infrastructure projects. Transport Ministry would like, uh, like to remind you that uh, Mr. Putin has set a task for 2024 to organize the shipping on the sea route of about 80 million tons of cargo. By that time, this is a very complex and difficult task, and we are working on realizing it. In addition to economic activity that is increasing in the Arctic, well, in parallel with it, there are many problems concerning the environment and providing good quality of life to people who live there. And this is talked about uh, in the whole world, about all the challenges that we face in the Arctic. And a very interesting, uh, very simple example. If the oil, if there are oil spills in the Arctic, 
There are many technical means of localizing and cleaning it up and so on, but there are still will be there are still difficulties. And this will be doubly difficult in the Arctic if this happens because there is like ice and so on and we have no idea how to clean the ice at the moment. And there are all these dilemmas. On the one hand, we need to develop economic, economically and the reserves of hydrocarbons there are quite large. This is our Russian potential. But we need to do that without harming the fragile Arctic nature. And uh, one specific question that I want to talk about is the readiness for emergencies. Are we ready if something happens? Uh, yes, we are ready in accordance with the current level of traffic when about 30 million tons are being transported in this region through the Northern Sea Route. And by 2024, this should rise to 80 million tons. And we, the Ministry of Transport, and our organizations, they provide emergency services in this region. There are emergency centers all over the region, specialized vessels, which are available 24-7. And there is in the state a program for the development of transportation system of Russia. There is a sub-program for constructing specialized multifunctional rescue vessels of high ice breaking class, which will serve in this region, which will be deployed in this region. In addition, together with Ross Atom, we talk about the issues and are working on uh, providing rescue services using icebreakers, which uh, usually clear ice for cargo ships. There are specialists there. There are necessary resources and so on, which can be used if there is a need for them. Another complex issue is the international aspect. In accordance with the federal law on internal waters and territorial waters, the Northern Sea Route is a national transportation system. I have already said, that the international laws, they uh, basically have the specific uh, guidelines for setting borders. And according to the UN Sea Navigation Charter, the Northern Sea Route is considered to be an area of free shipping. And uh, right now we have all these uh, debates about if this area can be considered a free shipping route, can we give the others the right to travel there? Are there going to be any routes, uh, rules for navigating this sea route and so on? And we're going to be contacting, uh, working together with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to try to resolve all the issues. We, as the state along the coast of which this route goes, we have, have the right to provide uh, the safety in this route. So if the vessels do not, have the, do not meet the necessary requirements of our country for safety, then this should not be there. And the Ministry of Transportation, Minister of Transport of Russia, it provides permissions, permits, for vessels to traverse the Northern Sea Route and do not have these permits, they could not enter there. And uh, this is uh, accepted in the whole world. And uh, our task is to keep it going. And I think I will finish on this. Well, there are many different aspects. I can talk about Arctic for a very long time. It's a very interesting region. There are many issues there. And there's much that we need to work about. Thank you very much, Vitaly Kluyev. 
And I would like to continue the topic that Nikolai Mikhailovich talked about, the integrated development of the territory and all directions that are within the perimeter of the Arctic topic. And I would like to ask Maria Mikhailovna, as the representative of the Corporation for the Development of the Far East, to comment and say which tasks are more priority ones and which are for long-term ones, and to talk about what the corporation is doing at the moment in the Arctic. Thank you. Hello, dear colleagues. Thank you for inviting me to take part in this forum. The Corporations for the Development uh, uh, of the Arctic is working with the Arctic is one of the priorities because Russian Arctic is one of the largest economic zones in the world that includes 66 municipalities in nine regions of our country. Uh, well, fully in the Arctic zone are uh, Yemal Nenets, Murmansk, Chukotka, and other regions are partly in the Arctic zone. So the area is huge. And it's symbolic today that today is the first anniversary of signing the agreement on assigning the resident of the Arctic zone of the Russian Federation. It's North Star Company working in Murmansk Oblast. Uh, working in Mitina port and uh, Belomorska oil base. Over 400 uh, million uh, rubles have been invested and more uh, than 19 uh, jobs have been created. And uh, we have in the Arctic zone about 216 of such uh, projects. The regime itself has been in place for about a year and we already have 216 residents, which proves that it is in great demand among the investors in our country. The total volume of investment makes 277 billion rubles and implies for some 9.5 new jobs. The residents that I've uh, mentioned have already invested over 13 billion rubles and created over 700 new jobs. In the last four man months, the growth rate of uh, new residents make some 25 new residents, which is very high. In the Far East, we don't witness uh, the similar figures. So the regime in the Arctic zone is quite appealing and the more and more new projects enter the Arctic zone. For the residents, we have a quite a wide range of uh, some tax benefits for both uh, large scale and small and medium businesses. Uh, most of them have to do with uh, some uh, Unfortunately, I cannot hear the speaker. Something went wrong with the translation and I cannot hear the speaker. Unfortunately, the interpreter still cannot hear the speaker. Так, а у нас что-то со связью какие-то проблемы. Марию, к сожалению, мы не слышим Михайловну. Unfortunately, we were not able to hear Maria. Now our colleagues will try to solve this issue. And now I would like to ask the people here in the studio to Vladimir and Alexander. So, Mr. Vasiliev, let's continue on the topic that was raised by Vitaly. 
clue if about the transport. If I get it right, then the transport system is one of the most important and key issues required for the development of the Arctic area. Tell me if I'm wrong. Yes, you are quite right. The whole life in the Arctic zone fully depends on a full-scale transportation system, which includes sea, river, air, and uh, ground transportation. Uh, uh, during summertime, the delivery of cargoes to the north, we use uh, uh, rivers. And uh, in winter time, we use these winter roads, which are actually not roads. By snow and by ice, we deliver cargoes. And we have to focus on these issues. Moreover, when we talk about the Arctic, for the population, we have not yet created quite comfortable conditions for the mobility. The problem is that our domestic flights are very expensive. For example, a uh, roundway uh, ticket from Tixi to Yakutsk is uh, more expensive than the same ticket from Moscow to Yakutsk. So it's hard to travel. So when we uh, talk about the uh, decrease in uh, outflow of population, it's just that people have no uh, chance, they have no possibility to leave, and they have to leave here. The significance of the Northern Sea route is just huge. They, uh, in the European part, uh, they construct uh, seaports, but in our part, we still have to do uh, a lot uh, here in Yakutia and uh, in Chukotka, I think that Mr. Kugayevsky can be more specific. And of course, the small aviation. Maria is back to us. Mr. Kugayevsky, we will get back to you a little bit later because this transportation topic is one of the key ones. So, Maria. We stopped at the most interesting point. I wanted to ask you about this 216 residents. Tell us about the areas where they operate and uh, what the projects are aimed at. But unfortunately, we still cannot hear the speaker. Unfortunately, I cannot hear you, Maria. Well, the problem is still here. Well, I hope that these technical obstacles will be somehow tackled. So, Mr. Kugayevsky, tell me, please, what are the specific numbers and what are the needs of the Arctic in this area? Vitaly то наши рыбаки сегодня ведут промысел свой рыбы с туристических моторных лодок. Это же неправильно. Это совершенно неправильно, потому что у нас просто нет такого флота в стране. То есть именно э, рыболовецкого малого флота, правильно я понимаю? Да, рыболовецкого малого флота, потому что каждый работает на своем участке рыболовном, который ему выделяется официально, и он 
работает на этих. Ну, кроме того, еще и сама организация. То, что было, как было у нас организовано это все в Советском Союзе в те времена, сегодня у нас практически этих технологий нет совсем. И вот выловив какой-то свой небольшой улов, 200 килограмм, предположим, лодка больше не поднимает, он ее везет на несколько сотен километров на базу, на, в холодильнике там, или в морозильнике. Вот. Ну и кроме того, у нас еще ведь много вопросов, связанных с использованием северного морского пути. Вот вчера мы обсуждали тему «малый северный морской путь». У нас такой, такой типа, термин появился. Хотя раньше это Я был... даже не слышала про такой. Да. Хотя это у нас раньше был единственный, един, единый великий северный морской путь. Вот. А теперь восточный сектор Арктики. Ну, это связано с тем, что основная тема обсуждения развития северного морского пути ушла в высокие широты. Вот этот транзитный путь – это там. А наше береговое хозяйство, к сожалению, оно не имеет достаточного обеспечения. Сегодня у нас речники обеспечивают все перевозки по восточному сектору Арктики. Выходя из Лены, они переходят, сами речники идут по морю и входят в, роте, в устье и в реки, в северные реки. Вот. Но тут тоже очень много забавных таких моментов. Когда-то мы давным-давно, это, наверное, 80-е годы, еще решали такую большую задачу по оптимизации транспортной сети. Вот. И когда мы доказали, что железная дорога до города Якутска жизненно необходима и эффективна, вот тогда у нас стал вопрос, а что делать с флотом, речным флотом. Потому что меняются габариты пути, это уже нижнее течение, среднее нижнее течение реки Лены, совсем другие габариты судовых ходов другие глубины, и тогда у нас уже встал, были предложения сделаны о э, модернизации речного флота. Можно увеличить габариты, можно увеличить грузоподъемность, увеличить ну, то есть эффективность. Речь идет о неком таком комплексном подходе к транспорту, да, да? сочетание и морского, и железного, Совершенно и, возможно, где-то автодорог. При современных технических возможностях и технологиях, вот Владимир Николаевич уже упомянул об автозимниках, теперь эта тема у нас меняется. Вполне возможно, что для субарктической зоны, вот эти, это те районы республики, которые находятся чуть дальше от побережья арктического, куда грузы во многие районы доходят только на третий год. Ого. Они один год плывут по лене, второй год они там зимуют на морских участках, потом на, на второй год они поднимаются же по рекам и дальше ждут, когда заработает зимний. И груз получает продовольствие, поступает в конечный пункт на, на третий год. Вот, поэтому, вот, решая вот эти задачки, мы должны уже сегодня взглянуть и на автомобильные перевозки по зимникам. Сегодня есть новые технологии. На, на теме комплексного развития а, вот, а, арктических территорий и возможностей сочетания различной инфраструктуры, я бы все-таки хотела попробовать вернуться к Марии Михайловне и продолжить с ней разговор. Мария, на связи ли вы? Не слышу. А я снова не слышу Марию Михайловну. Ладно. А, так, а, у нас технические проблемы. Вот, кстати, говоря про инфраструктуру, а, вот, на мой взгляд, помимо, собственно, транспортной, очень важно является информационная. То есть а, сейчас, ну, как а, одно из последствий пандемии, это а, цифровизация всего, что только можно. Вот как этот процесс проходит в арктической зоне? Потому что, насколько я знаю, есть труднодоступные места, куда окно не протянуть никогда. Ну или протянуть, но в какой-то очень далекой перспективе. Как справляетесь вы, какие есть технологии, методы решения проблем? Ну, здесь я бы хотел сказать, что наша республика Саха-Якути является одним из передовых регионов в этом направлении, в направлении цифровизации. Наше правительство тянет оптоволокно вместе с Ростелеком и с другими операторами в архические районы. Сейчас идет строительство оптоволокна в сторону Набарского района, это северо-западная часть. Они дошли, насколько я помню, до Оленевского района, то есть осталось совсем немного. И такая, так, да, ну, да, но там мы, мы, у нас же совершенно Ма, другие... В масштабах Якутии это совсем немного. Да, мы, мы совершенно другими категориями мыслим, когда говорим об расстояниях, о расстояниях. Ну и, конечно, оптоволокно идет на северо-восток, в сторону Черского 
и с уровня ТИКСИ. Вот это основные вот три направления, по которым мы хотели бы обеспечить оптоволокно. Ну и, конечно, в арктических районах сейчас, пока это волокно идет, используется, конечно, спутниковая связь. Она очень дорогая, но, тем не менее, при решении определенных задач вынуждены использовать и этот момент. Ну и работа с, собственно, с сотовыми операторами. Здесь у нас Билайн активно освоил муниципальные районы. Сейчас дело за МТС и Мегафоном. И я думаю, что вот эта сеть в ближайшем будущем покроет всю территорию республики. Речь еще, еще идет об обеспечении сотовой связи по федеральным трассам. Это трасса Колыма, трасса Лена и федеральная трасса Вилюй. Вот три основные дороги и по которым можно будет разговаривать по сотовому телефону на протяжении, находясь в тайге и так далее. Точки. Да, с любой точки строятся вышки. То есть эта часть идет достаточно быстрыми темпами у нас, дается приоритет, потому что в условиях пандемии мы видим, как важна связь, и мы должны, образовательная деятельность не должна останавливаться, муниципальная работа не должна останавливаться, вот связь. То есть вот такие... Спасибо. Да. Вот. Ну вот э, так что э, цифровизация э, позволяет еще э, достаточно быстрыми темпами развивать отрасли креативной индустрии. Это поддержка на местного населения, э, народного прикладного искусства и так далее. А, вот, кстати, про, э, Микрофон. Э, кстати, про прикладное искусство. Давайте все-таки попытаемся снова выйти в Zoom. Я надеюсь, мы поговорили про цифровизацию, да, и у нас все наладилось. Вот. Итак, Мария Михайловна, наша третья или четвертая попытка, я уже сбилась со счета. Вы меня слышите? Да, я вас слышу. Ура! Слышите ли вы меня? И я вас слышу, и это отлично. Отлично. Пока, пока возвращаемся. Да, возвращаемся к этому вопросу. Okay, so we are returning to the question that is very interesting for me. So what do the residents of the economic zone are doing? What are the goals of their businesses and which, uh, what are their plans for the future? Dear colleagues, as I have already said, the regime is attractive for the large enterprises and for small and medium businesses. And the demand of this regime is quite high among the small and medium enterprises as well, because about 90% of all our residents are those companies, because this gives the opportunity to develop these small projects and to provide employment for local population in these projects. And in these territories, the economy is developing much more healthily. The main industries where these projects are developed are the tourism, 25% of all our residents of 216 residents have projects in the sphere of tourism. There are many projects in construction and reconstruction of hotels, hotel businesses for developing r and &R bases. And there is also large share in transportation and logistics, as well as the development of housing, and then we have all the other industries. So the priority is the tourism, which is a very interesting direction and gains lots of attention right now, especially in the Arctic as well. And I also wanted to talk about one mechanism that is working in the Arctic at the moment, is the territories of fast, rapid economic development. And there are specialized fields there which we are developing at the moment. In all regions of Russia, we have at least two regions, Murmansk and Chukotka, where there are territories of rapid economic development and social development. In Murmansk and Chukotka, and these regimes are in high demand. And there are many investors which are implementing their projects there. And there are a number of support mechanisms there, including the taxation preferences, fiscal preferences, and infrastructure support. 
discounted loans and so on, which are important for our investors. When we talk about Murmansk, there are nine large investment projects there with a total investment of 96 billion rubles of which about 65 billion rubles has already been invested to thirds of the plant investments and over 1,000 workplaces have been created of the 5,000 plant ones. This is a very good result shown to us by Murmansk. From the point of view of economic potential, we are implementing different preferential regimes and the corporation is also actively participating in socially important projects. And one of these projects is the, the Arctic Hectare. Returning to the studio, Maria Mikhailovna started to talk about the Arctic hectare. And Alexander Andreevich, what do you think? What is the interest level of this mechanism? And why would the people take it? So about 36 contracts of free use have been signed and at present we have about two and a half thousand applications for getting the Arctic hectare and these dynamics taking into account the fact that it's only been on for two months two months shows its high demand. And we can also talk about our interaction with the indigenous people of the Arctic. And this topic is very interesting and important for us as well. And you probably know my colleagues are writing to me that I have some issues. Rustam Armanenkov says that everything is good. We have even tried to talk about the Arctic Hector and the question that I would like to ask to you and then to our experts here is this program, the Arctic Hector, from your point of view, who is going to be using this program, who is going to be applying for this and why, what will it be needed to develop, what kind of businesses, technologies, what directions? And uh, they're saying that there are some issues, but, well, colleagues, uh, this uh, Arctic Hector program is for creating housing or maybe implementing some small businesses such as stories projects or some small projects in the sphere of services. And there are a number of problems that we are facing now, such and they should be resolved so that this mechanism will be realized successfully. So some of the issues I'm going to talk about, first of all, is the incorrect coordinate system for the land plots that are being allocated and this actually hinders the program. Second, the, when the, these land plots do not follow the requirements of regulations and rules as well as the legislation and because we all know that there are a number of regulations from the state that need to be followed. And what has been talked a lot about in the Far East and the Arctic, uh, it's the lack of territories for providing these hectares. Well, it is high, in high demand, but not all regions on the Arctic can are giving at the moment land for this program for free use by citizens of these land plants, there is about uh, one million hectares of land. More of, most of them are in Murmansk, Karelia, 
and a little bit in other regions. In comparison, Murmansk has about 700, uh, they are ready to give 730,000 hectares for free, Karelia 330,000 hectares, and in other regions it's less than 20,000 hectares. So there is a kind of a disbalance and we're going to be working with the regions and we'll try to resolve this issue. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, despite the difficulties with connection, we have heard you and you have heard us. And I would like to continue the discussion of the topic. And what I really liked is uh, that the residents and the main directions are focused on non-raw material sector. Usually people think that the Arctic is mostly interesting due to its natural resources, uh, hydrocarbons, metals, diamonds, and so on. However, the non-raw material sector is the one that needs support, first of all. And I would like to ask this question to Ramanian Kavarostam. From your point of view, what directions should become the key ones and is it possible to move from raw materials economy to non-raw materials economy? Can this be done in the Arctic? Thank you very much for this opportunity. So, colleagues, my life is the energy transition. For 12 years, I was employed by Gazprom Neft. In 2019, together with Mr. Krutikov, we drafted a law on preferences, and I brought some uh, uh, numbers about the shelf and the petrochemistry. And now you ask me about this energy transition. Yes, the situation is changing and you are changing. Yes, of course. And I think that we are going to change it now because there are now two important nuances about this transition. So the, uh, this is a transition of thinking and approach. The first uh, important issue is the energy transition. It is important not uh, only because uh, we talk about it for a long time, especially now under the Russian chairmanship uh, on the Arctic Council, this uh, Sustainable Development Working Group and our Foreign Affairs Ministry. Uh, uh, sustainable finance in Arctic and other terminology are now quite uh, familiar, like green funding. All the issues that uh, make us think whether we will get the money from the banks tomorrow for some carbon project that uh, leaves some uh, carbon footprint, or even uh, the Northern Sea Route. You know that this uh, term uh, has been modifying. We used the term of Northern Sea Transport Corridor when we wanted to create an alternative, not just a cabotage corridor. Now they also discuss the term of um, Northern Sea Shipping Route. So. Now we have a specific assignment from our Prime Minister from September 20 that we have to prepare for the energy transition. So it's not just a thesis, it has to be a roadmap, a plan. Uh, Mr. Bilausov coordinates this work in the government, so today this is a specific task, it's not just the issue for a discussion or some beautiful phrases and words. So the topic of carbon-free economy and technologies is uh, now a subject topic. And uh, one of the steps that I want to showcase 
in the center of Arctic initiatives, one of our areas of activity is the Energy Techno Hub established in St. Petersburg. Maybe you have heard about it. If you are interested, you can uh, look, uh, 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 you can visit the website. Initially, it was launched by Gazprom Neft the, and Yandex. This was the partnership uh, when we signed the agreement. But now we have to understand that among the technologies that uh, have to do with the ways and characteristics of uh, production cycle of oil extraction and processing and some alternative ways of oil spills liquidation, we have to think about how the energy techno hub will work for this energy transition. Because the Silicon Valley that we are trying to establish has to prepare a platform and uh, a research and development base for this transition. Because we perfectly understand that today's major deficit is the lack of uh, research and development. Because we have all these testing grounds and uh, technologies, but they all aim at traditional ways of economy. And now we have to talk about the alternative energy sources and uh, new technologies from this position. And about the alternatives such as uh, hydrogen or methanol, at least. Because uh, this is a conventional green ec um, economy. And then second nuance, which is especially significant to me, is another non-raw material part of the Arctic, is the cultural and uh, historical and um, uh, ecologically fragile uh, environment. And I am responsible for this humanitarian uh, domain. And we communicate and cooperate with Maria a lot. What we have done this year, we have a project, the Children of the Arctic. Uh, I, a month ago, together with the Minister of the Arctic, we launched a multimedia language portal, which is not just an educational environment, but it will work as a constituting uh, positive content. We now have this information wars, and it is important for our youth of such huge territory as the Far East. Uh, they had to have good contents, not something that they can find in the internet. There is another specific um, uh, project, the preservation of cultural and historical uh, heritage in the Arctic. We have uh, researched all the museums in the Arctic, including those maintained by some elderly women in remote villages. And we are going to exhibit uh, what we have found at the cultural forums. Uh, the Ministry for Culture um, supported us and uh, they proposed to create the Association of Northern Museums. So uh, last year people were asking me, do you know at all if they have something there? Have you been there? Yes, I have. And now I know what they have there. And uh, in the next year, if everything goes fine, we will continue doing with these museums. And when the Association of Northern Museums will be established, it will be even more specific. There is another project worth mentioning, which is called Ecology has to do with everyone. It's another accent on the treasury of our ecology. We have uh, organized this uh, process and it was launched by uh, Rosprirodnadzor. Now we are almost at the peak of this uh, project. 
In Moscow, we will convene children from some 40 countries with their environmental projects, and we will award them and send them to Arlonok environmental camp. And we want it to be annual, well, environmental camp will be in the Arctic. Well, not to scare anybody, we decided to organize this camp in Arlonok, not in the Arctic. Yes, I think that uh, maybe on some white sea there is a base that could host the children who work on some environmental projects. So I call upon my friends in the regions to involve, because we still have time, Please continue to be engaged in our projects. Uh, the, there is a problem, of course, this pandemic. It is very difficult to bring people from Peru or from Benin to Moscow, but we will do our best to do it in November for them to see a real result. And another project, I think that our colleagues from Yakutia will be glad to hear it. Uh, we started the expedition on polar bear in Tixi and we were welcomed by the head of uh, our, of the Republic. And frankly, I, I would really want to be personally in Yakutia, and I was supposed to be in Chukotka, otherwise I would, come, I would have come personally. I love Yakutia. So we started from there, and uh, quite some days ago there was a press conference, and uh, Mr. Karchunov from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who was there, told me that we had to convene the ambassadors there to involve them in this work. Because you have a unique material. We're still editing the film. It will be ready by the end of the film. And our film from the previous uh, expedition has already received some prizes. And our colleagues who have organized this expedition, they are just great people. So, my friends, uh, talking about uh, this uh, non-raw material treasury, this is something that has to be worked with. We should not be skeptical about it. We have to provide our uh, colleagues from Ross Tourism with the information. Yes, there are some logistic problems and small aviation problems, but they can be solved if we join our efforts. And uh, uh, we will not come to some small and humble cafe. But uh, we will visit uh, these uh, museums and it will be a totally different story. And I think that uh, I, uh, it will be a very good success story for the chairmanship uh, of the Russian Federation in the Arctic Council. So in Chukotka yesterday they asked me how we construct a dialogue with our neighbors. So uh, without uh, competition but so uh, I told them the life is that uh, if we do not compete then all conversations will be friendly thank you very much uh, Rustam it was very pleasant to communicate with the people who are so dedicated and inspired and who do so much but I have to come back to the studio and we will continue our conversation with Mr. Kugayevsky. And I want to slightly change my question about the Arctic hectare. If we take into account that the main treasure of the Arctic are the people 
culture and all the possibilities for their development. The Arctic hectare, is it the possibility, opportunity for keeping people in the Arctic, for stopping them emigrating? Do you think it's an effective mechanism for this? When we heard about the Arctic hectare, I am one of those per people who is slightly of a different opinion. It's like, uh, what is a hectare when we don't have like that many people here? And, and, well, yeah, where should it be there? Yes, the Far Eastern hectare, that program was really nice uh, because it was in places which were relatively warm and you could do like uh, some many different activities there. As for the Arctic hectare, we need to start to understand where should it work? It shouldn't be only territory because we have horse breeding in the Arctic which produce very high quality products and even like maybe uh, which can have medicinal properties as some of our biologists say. So if you want to start like a horse breeding program there, you need large, large territories there. And for the reindeer herders, one hectare is very small because they do not stay in one place. They migrate from one place to another. And in Salihart, we had this meeting where we uh, saw this territory of Yalala Nenets Okruk, uh, where they could give this hectare. And they couldn't find any places because uh, basically all the raw material mining companies, they are all over that region. And it seems that only near Salihart, the capital of this region, they could give this hectare. And they still do not know for whom to do that, how to do it. That is why we need to understand first where should this hectare be. So for your point of view, this program needs to be improved. Yes, uh, depending on the situation in the region, in the specific conditions and so on. So, okay, what you got the land, what next? What should you do? If you want like a horse breeding farm there, you need like some installations. Where is the money for that? And Vladimir Putin asked this question a lot. He's saying like, where's the money? So you, as you raised the issue of reindeer breeding, if we started talking about this, please tell us. I heard about the project, well, I'm not sure how to call it correctly, digitalization of reindeer. This is like monitoring the migration of reindeer herds using drones and so on. Do you think this is this has future and can it actually look after large herds? Yes, I have my friends who are doing that for some time now. And we have been in a conference in Norway and there has been a director of one large reindeer herd, 1500 heads. And we met with her, and she said once, my reindeer, they are moving to Krasnodar. And she asked, why are you doing that? And they said, uh, I opened my computer, and I can see where they are. And uh, we couldn't even, like, uh, contact with our Russian colleagues because we were in a very remote area in Norway. And then uh, we managed to actually contact them and the Russian authorities and ask them to return those reindeer. And this was due to wild reindeer that were just moving around and all the domesticated reindeer just followed them. So this is the digitalization. And yes, if there's going to be some kind of a state program, support from the state, this is quite possible, yes. And uh, my friends, reindeer herders, come to Yakutsk here and they're asking me, where can we find drones? To, and they're saying, this is good, yes, this is like for collecting 
the reindeer, for protecting them from wolves and so on. And yes, the plans are to provide state support for this. Yes, a large program needs to be developed for this. There should be not only monetary support, there should also be support from the hardware producers, the navigation systems for this drones, uh, there are many uh, issues connected with this. We are discussing these topics, and this is the same about horse breeding with the same tax, because they're like, uh, we're talking about very large territories. If the horses just uh, go wherever they want, it's kind of hard to herd them all together. So there are these many issues that we are facing at the moment. We're talking about, yes, there's legislation, there are strategies, and so on. Uh, this is good, because this is a qualified discussion. But we need to think about uh, details as well. So this is what we wanted to talk about at our expert discussion, how to connect the strategic plans with the realities on the ground in the regions. The strategic plans, they need to be corrected and they need uh, according to the situation on the ground. That's why we're talking today. For example, what was what we talked about with Rustam Romanenkov, Children of the Arctic Project. Do you think it has future? Does it have a future? And maybe there are some similar projects on the regional level. Yes, the Children of the Arctic Project is very large. We, as an international Northern Forum organization, are slightly confused, maybe, because here in Yakutia, there is a regional project with regional coordinators, the Arctic Ministry, and the parliament is working on this, the local parliament. And there is the Federal Agency for Nationalities and the Ministry for the Development of the Arctic and the Far East. They are also saying they are working on this project. There's a large working group, international one. And there are many different projects in other countries with the same name. And when we were discussing this project, when trying to approve it on the level of the Arctic Council, we proposed to bring together all the people who are talking about this project and to finally decide who is going to do what. And the portal was really nice. The educational component will help a lot to children from other regions and countries to understand what is the Arctic, what the people in the Arctic do, how can they help each other, how can the Arctic help the world, and the world can help the Arctic. And these kind of resources are really necessary, as well as the digitalization of the cultural and natural heritage. Uh, Rustam Ramanenkov talked very well about museums. There are museums in every settlement about which nobody knows. There are enthusiasts there who are establishing this museum, collecting their artifacts, and so on. And if we can uh, put it into the digital space, it's going to be really good for accessibility for people to know about them. That is why we propose, uh, seeing that uh, Rustam Romanenkov here, uh, let us meet somewhere and decide what we should do so that we will have a clear plan of action so that uh, not uh, people so that people will not do stuff individually and may even like duplicate their efforts. And this will be very good work. And when I am talking about the Arctic residents, the legislation requires for the companies to be registered in the Arctic. But there are many different companies who are producing equipment and technologies for, the Ar for use in the Arctic. Uh, but they are located in other regions of Russia and even in different countries. Can they be counted as residents of the Arctic zone without uh, them moving physically there? Yes, this is a good question. We should ask this for our, to our legislators. And Nikolai, uh, and then uh, there has been these ideas about uh, starting this brand 
of the Arctic, made in Arctic? Is it uh, something that was made by the Arctic residents, like in Yakutia, for example, it's in Tixi, who is located there and producing the goods there and with very high costs and so on? Or there are other companies who are in Moscow or St. Petersburg who are buying the products from the Arctic and they produce very good goods made of this. Can they be part of this brand made in the Arctic? That is why we have these discussions and with our international experts in order to create the first concept. As I understand, the brands of these products well, I want to go to your shops after this forum. So, what is the demand for your products in foreign countries? Because, as I understand, the relation to brands made in the Arctic uh, are the goods uh, connected with the environment, like unique features and handmade. Yes, you are correct. And under this brand, we can export into other countries, but a big analytical work needs to be done. Which companies are producing different goods in the Arctic or from Arctic materials? What quality is needed? What, and we need certification set centers. We need a big number of experts to ensure the necessary quality and we need to help these companies in their export operations because our legislation is actually quite large and it's very complex and even foreign investors are saying your legislation is very um, not easy to understand. That is why our work is very large. Yes, I have been working on what Vladimir is talking about. Uh, well, uh, the first question, what can we give to the children in the Arctic? From my childhood, I remember such an expression of going to the mainland, for example. Where have you been? I have come back from the mainland. So this is some sort of island psychology. But now it has vanished when we were able to uh, install digital communication in our republic. So now people, they don't feel uh, separated for example, horse breeders can call home and to learn the news and uh, even the father stays in this horse breeding base for months, he via this communication can stay with the family. So our primary task is to uh, get uh, communication to the remote areas. But uh, Rustam Leonidovich was right to say about the content. Uh, we have to create our own content for the children. As uh, for producing some original products, but everything is original and unique. Even if you take some grass, it's unique. There are no such climatic uh, conditions in the world. If it is yellow in autumn, it doesn't mean that it's dead. It will revitalize, uh, it will uh, revive in uh, spring. And the horses that graze on this uh, grass, they are totally different. Their meat, their milk is absolutely different and unique. So these... Uh, strive of exporting this product outside the Republic, first of all, we have to promote it. For example, in Moscow, I'm, when I was in Moscow, and I saw a white fish, and it said Yakut white fish, but actually it was a Canadian one. Well, this is some marketing stuff, but 
at the same time, we tried to market the meat of uh, Yakut cow because the fat, the fat of this milk is uh, 6% and it can uh, feed from under the snow and uh, the meat is uh, very unique without any technological uh, devices. But in order to register it as a specific product, you have to somehow define the place of origin. And this is a gap in our legislation. We can write that it was made in the Arctic, but we don't know the borders of the Arctic. So, for example, if you produce something in this Arctic hectare, then uh, it becomes more concrete. And uh, now there is an owner for this uh, land, and he wouldn't allow anyone to enter uh, to his land because this land has been registered as an exclusive territory. So it's not that this is his ownership. Uh, you know that our horse meat is subdivided into five categories. Well, we can speak forever about it, but I think that we have touched upon the uniqueness, the need for further development of legislation, and the need for comprehensive development of the Arctic territories. And I'm very grateful to our participants that despite uh, some technical problems, you remained with us and you were involved in the discussion. And I hope that uh, some uh, new joint projects will be born out of this communication. Thank you very much to all participants. Stay tuned. The uh, live streams of the Northern, Forum, of the Northern Sustainable Development Forum.